While it's a new year, we are continuing our discussion on helping guide you through the home buying process. We've taken you through the pre-approval process. We've taken you through the process of writing an offer, getting your offer accepted. Now we're going to take you through the process. Now we're going to take you through the process of once your offer is accepted, what actually happens? What happens during that escrow period? So if you have a contract written for 30 days, how does that 30 days play out? So we're going to dive into that in a little bit more detail and and really help you nail down the home buying process and, and getting you to the finish line. Josh? Yeah, Jeb, I don't know about you, but two of the most common questions I get are someone comes when they're just new to the process and they say, I'd like to buy a home. I don't know what that means. Where do I start? What do I do? So we've covered a lot of that ground already. The second one is we have them pre-approved. We have them with a realtor. Maybe it's you, Jeb. You guys are out looking at homes. You've written offers. Now we have one accepted. And they look around and they go, <laughs> okay, we got an offer accepted. What next? Um, there's a lot of things to do. And we're going to go through those steps. But I don't know what your feelings are on this, Jeb. The reality is when we've done this right, most of the work is already done. There are some things that cannot happen until that contract is accepted, but the hard work is behind you. I feel like at this point, we're just connecting the dots. Is that about right? No, I, I agree. I, the, the process is very front loaded um, in a sense, especially once you get your offer accepted. A lot of people out there believe, hey, I've got a 30 day escrow or a 45 day escrow. I'm going to be doing something for 30 days or 45 days. If I don't hear from my agent today, there's something wrong. There's there's a problem in in the transaction, and that's not the case. I mean, we're, what we're going to do here is kind of walk you through what that looks like, uh, so that you can kind of understand where we are, um, you know, as agents, as mortgage professionals, in walking you through that process. So the process is really going to start. You know, once your offer is accepted, you have signatures from the seller, signatures from the buyer. You have a binding contract. Escrow is going to start when that escrow deposit actually reaches the escrow office. If you're in an escrow state, um, some states are attorney states and, and your deposit gets sent to, to a title office or maybe to an attorney or what have you. And that's when the, the process really starts, right? That's when the, you know, part of the contract is that you have, you know, here in the state of California, you have three days to get that escrow deposit into, into the, the escrow company, if you will. And then that's, that's, you know, when the contract really starts. Well, it actually starts on the day that the offer is accepted uh, by both parties, but you have three days to get it in there. And then everything is really moving forward. That's when escrow starts the escrow instructions and your lender gets the package from escrow and can really start to move forward. And that's where, you know, we're going to start here and actually talk about a couple of things. Now, we've we've talked about escrow deposit in the past, uh, so we're not going to dive into the details there. But let's start the process by actually talking about how that money gets to the escrow company, how that process, you know, starts initially. Because what happens oftentimes is when you write an offer to purchase a home, you know, back in the day, what we used to do is actually get a copy of a check from a buyer showing that you're, you know, you're writing the deposit, you know, we make it out to escrow company and we say that, you know, if your deposit was $5,000 or $10,000, we would have you write a check for $10,000. We would take a copy of that and submit it along with the offer, basically kind of showing good faith that, hey, we have a copy of the check. We're ready to send it into escrow once that contract is executed. Over the years, it's changed a little bit. You know, we don't really, you know, here in, in when I write offers, I don't really provide that these days. A lot of agents on the other side aren't asking for it. Now, I know a lot of agents out there still do it because I receive it on, on listings that I have. But just because you've written that check doesn't mean that money has yet made it to escrow. So you have a couple of different options when when opening escrow. And one of those is going to be able to you know take a check, if you will, and take it into escrow. Your agent can do it. You can take it in. Um, but a lot of times, the quicker method is going to be by wiring the money, right? So you're going to get wiring instructions from the escrow company, typically from some sor sort of secure portal, if you will, uh, you know, in order to, you know, protect you um, against, you know, uh, wire fraud and all these different things, which we can elaborate here in just a minute. But essentially, you're going to get this document and you're going to wire that money into escrow. And that really is where the process starts, Josh. 
And Jeb, you know, in most areas of life, when you get these types of warnings, be careful, don't do this, don't do that. Um, it's over an abundance of, of caution. But in reality, in real estate and mortgage, there is an awful lot of wire fraud. Now, it's not even 1% of transactions. It's probably not one-tenth of 1% of transactions. But it happens often enough that every mortgage and real estate person you know has either been involved in or heard a transaction of a 10,000, a 50,000, a $500,000 wire going to the wrong place with a bad actor globally intercepting an email, sending false wire instructions. So the easiest way to do that is last thing you do before you send your wire, call the escrow company and just verify this came from you and this is where you want the wire, correct? So that's a, a really good piece of advice. And the reason for the wire, you absolutely can do a check. You can do a cashier's check. It's on the front end of the process. So it's not like that money has to be there and available. So if it takes a few days for a check to clear, not a big deal. But for everyone's sake, it's just quicker, faster, easier to get it over there. No one has to manually drive a check over to escrow and no one has to wait for it to clear. So for us here in, in California, 95% plus of transactions end up with a, a wire over there. So Jeb, once that happens, we, you, so you as the realtor, you have the offer accepted, you've instructed your client, send the wire over, the realtor or the borrower sends us a copy of this executed contract, and then we need to know who escrow and title are going to be. And I say we, we the lender, need to know who the escrow and title company are. The contract is going to tell us who the realtors are. We obviously know who our buyer is. So there's two very important things that we have to do. Now that we have our sixth item that requires disclosures within 72 hours, that would be the address of the real property that you're going to buy. We have 72 hours to get your disclosures out to you. I want to get them out much faster so that you can see, hey, what is my rate if I'm choosing to lock or what could I choose to lock today? What's my cash to close? What's my payment? Make sure we're all on the same page. Once you sign and acknowledge those disclosures, now we can order an appraisal and you can incur that charge. Prior to that, if I haven't made those disclosures to you, you can't even pay for the appraisal. Now, a lot of times, probably 95% of the time, in the interest of not losing any time, we're gonna order the appraisal on our company credit card before you even sign those disclosures so that we're actually getting it ordered as quickly as possible because that's one other potential stressor. So from our end, the first two things we're doing, introducing ourselves to everyone in, in the transaction, sending out disclosures to you, the borrower, and getting that appraisal ordered. So whether it takes five days, seven days, 15 days to get that back, we can start that clock rolling, knowing that we're gonna have the appraisal back. You know, and something important to note here, you know, Josh mentioned, you know, as soon as he gets that accepted contract, he's working on getting those disclosures out. And the reason that this is important is because, you know, as a buyer, you should pretty much know your lender, who you're going to use, when your offer is accepted. What I often see uh, is, is buyers scrambling, you know, once their offer is accepted, figuring out what lender am I gonna use or trying to shop around rate, trying to do different things to figure out where they're going to go. And in, and in turn, delaying the process. The, the, the longer it takes you to make a decision on the lender that you're going to choose with, the longer it takes to get those disclosures out, the longer it takes to order the appraisal, and in turn, potentially pushing you out of contract um, in some sense. If you can't meet certain deadlines, you can't close on time. So just make sure you do your homework in advance. You know, we've talked, you know, in, in the past on, on different episodes about getting pre-approval and the importance of, of working with a professional. Just do that up front. Don't put yourself in a position once your offer is accepted. Now you're trying to figure out who you're going to go with because ultimately it can backfire. Um, and Jeb, yeah. Jeb, just to close the loop on that, our objective is within 24 hours of receiving that contract, have the file submitted to underwriting. Our, that puts us in a worst case situation where 48 hours we're in underwriting. Now, a year ago, it could take seven to 10 days to get an approval back when the market's really busy. Right now, most lenders are going to have an approval back in about 48 hours. But what did we just talk about? 48 hours to get it into underwriting, 48 hours, 72 hours to get it back. It's about five business days. So now we're talking a week. You in that contract, Jeb, wrote certain contingency dates in there. We want to have that approval back as soon as possible. What are the things from the loan side for me as a lender that, that can be stressful? Am I going to get my loan approved? Is my property going to appraise? We want to jump on those as quickly as possible. And if you're taking two, three, four days, which 
Jeb, this doesn't happen often, but probably every six months I'll be talking to someone. They're like, okay, I'm going to call you back tomorrow. I'm hoping to make a, a lender uh, decision. And I go, okay, cool. When did you get your contract accepted? Well, last Friday. I'm like, you're three days into a 30 day escrow and you're hoping to make a decision on day four. And I know that those contingency time periods started running from the date of acceptance. You are making things stressful for you and you're making life hard on everyone. So by all means, do your due diligence up front. Know who you're using by the time you start writing offers. Yeah. And a lot of these things that we're talking about today happen simultaneous. You know, while Josh is working on the mortgage disclosures, while he's working on, you know, ordering the appraisal, if you will, escrow in turn or the attorney or whatever, you know, the, the the title office of the state that you're in is working on drawing up, you know, documents on their side, uh, the the listing agent, depending on, you know, what they did prior to, to accepting an offer, they're working on getting disclosures from their seller. So a lot is happening, happening simultaneously. And as a buyer, you're getting hit with a lot of these things at one time. And earlier, you know, I mentioned this process is somewhat front loaded and it's front loaded in the sense that you get a lot of paperwork at the beginning of the process. You get the mortgage disclosures, you get your escrow paperwork, uh, you know, you might get the title report, you might get the seller disclosures, you're doing inspections, all of this stuff kind of in the first 10, 15 days of the process. And then, you know, there's kind of a, a, a lull, if you will, on your side as a buyer while the lender's doing their job, while agents are doing their job, trying to finalize paperwork, while the escrow company's doing their job. And so just understand that there's a lot going on at one time, but a lot of it happens behind the scenes without you as a buyer really knowing uh, what's taking place. So with that said, as that offer gets accepted and Josh is working on loan disclosures and working on ordering the appraisal, I, as an agent, working on getting inspections scheduled, right? It's an important part of the process. In the state of California, the contract gives you 17 days to have your inspections removed on that contract. In fact, you have 17 days to do all of your contingencies, but most of the time we're shortening those contingencies to make your offer a little bit more competitive. And in turn, we're, we're having to meet quicker deadlines. And so, you know, we're trying to order that home inspection as soon as you go into escrow. And, and it might be, you know, we're in, in charge of, of the termite inspection just based on how we wrote the contract. We might be, you might be a buyer that wants to get a mold inspection or a sewer inspection. So whatever inspections you're wanting to do as a buyer, we're working on scheduling those as early in the process as possible. Uh, because we, we, you know, as agents, I mean, me as an agent, I'm looking at you as a buyer that is going to move forward with this transaction unless something completely falls apart. So we're trying to get as much of this done up front so that there's no delays in the timelines. And the reason I say that is because there's times when when buyers say, hey, listen, I don't want to order any, uh, you know, inspections until my loan gets approved or till my appraisal comes back. And I know the values there. I don't want to waste money on a home inspection uh, or do these things until I know that I'm moving forward. It's difficult most of the time to, to, to do one of these things, you know, stacked behind another and not do them simultaneously because, you know, it takes a couple of days to schedule a, an appraisal, sometimes weeks, depending on where you're located. It takes a couple of days, maybe even a week or two to schedule a home inspection in some cases because these guys are busy. So you're, you're having to do a lot of these things with the intent that you're moving forward. Um, and so that's what I'm working on as an agent to start that process is really working on, you know, the inspections, making sure you're getting the disclosures, getting the title report, getting the escrow instructions from the escrow company. And it's not just me, it's a team, right? I have a transaction coordinator that's also helping me with this paperwork as Josh has a loan processor on his side and you're working with that person. So oftentimes you might be working with another person on a team, but ultimately helping you get to the same goal. Um, which is getting past these 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 you know initial uh, I won't say trial periods but these contingency periods so that you can confirm that you're moving forward. So you've got your loan disclosures, you've done your appraisal, you've done your inspections. Now, now the next process is kind of a renegotiation of the contract in some cases, right? So negotiation one when it comes to buying a house is getting your offer accepted. Right. Once your offer is accepted, that's negotiation one. Negotiations don't end once your offer is accepted. Oftentimes there's a second, third negotiation in the process. You know, your appraisal. What happens if your appraisal comes back less 
than the purchase price. That's a renegotiation of, of the price if you as a buyer want to try to get the seller to renegotiate. More often than not, the appraisal comes in at value, but the renegotiation happens when inspections take place, right? There's there's things that, that are, you know, uh, wrong with the property, uh, maybe cosmetically, maybe, maybe, you know, just physically wrong with the property. And you as a buyer want to get them fixed, or maybe in turn, you want a credit to get them fixed. And so that's a renegotiation of the contract. And that renegotiation doesn't happen until after these inspections have taken place. So that's more or less how the process moves forward, moves forward. But, you know, when does that renegotiation take place? Well, it depends on when your contingencies need to be removed. So if you've taken that 17 day contingency period and shortened it down to 10 days, then you need to make sure that you renegotiating the contract prior to that 10 day, you know, expiration of your contingencies, if you will. Now, I often have buyers asking, well, what happens if we start the negotiation prior to that contingency removal, but we don't have an agreement? Like the, the seller's not agreeing to what we're asking, do I still have to remove my contingencies on day 10? The answer is no. As long as you're still communicating, still trying to finalize that negotiation, then that contingency is still out in the open, if you will. Um, now they can force, you know, by by using a notice to perform and doing some other things to, to try to force you to, to, to release contingencies and what have you, but that's a whole different process and, and typically doesn't happen. Um, as long as communication is open and as long as that negotiation is actually ongoing and taking place. And from there, you're removing contingencies. That's kind of the next step in the process is once you're in, you know, once these inspections are completed, once the appraisal is completed, once you have loan approval, which we'll have Josh kind of elaborate here on in just a minute, you know, and, and you've reviewed the seller disclosures, you've reviewed, reviewed the title report, all of, you know, reviewed the HOA docs. So if there's HOA docs, you're at a point now when you can release contingencies on the property. And that's when that escrow deposit that you initially put in, that good faith deposit that we started the process with, that's when states like California, that money becomes non-refundable at that point. That's when that money is at risk. I often have buyers asking, well, if I put this money into escrow, is do I get it back if I cancel escrow? Is is it refundable? And the answer is typically yes until you release these contingencies. At which point contingencies are released, then you know then it's kind of that lull that I was talking about earlier, where there's not really a lot that happens on the real estate side during this process. But you're likely continuing to fulfill conditions on on Josh's side on the mortgage side, Josh. Absolutely. One of the biggest misconceptions that we get all the time is, cool, my loan's approved, I'm done, right? Your initial loan approval is always going to be a conditional approval. I've never seen a loan get submitted and come back with zero conditions. I've seen one come back with zero borrower conditions, but there's always something that is required from title, from escrow, from one of the agents in terms of dotting I's and crossing T's in the contract. So it's important to note that we are going to go through the loan approval with you and we're gonna go through all of the conditions that apply to you and the remaining conditions in the file so that you can know, are there any deal breakers in there? So the misconception is that you don't release your loan contingency until you have unconditional loan approval, until all those conditions are cleared. As a, just to put it in context, I have a deal that's closing on Monday. We're working on clearing the last conditions today. That's how far it goes into the process. Some of these things cannot be completed till the very last minute. Some of the things kind of relate back to other stuff that Jeb was talking about. Let's say there's um, some termite issues and the appraiser calls it out. We get a termite report done and the seller has agreed to do it. Well, we need to have a reinspection to verify that that termite completion was done. So that can come down to the 11th hour. It can be coming in right the day that we fund the loan. So really as a lender, my job is to go through and say, are any of these deal breakers? Are any of these items, if you provide me this item, could anything in there be an issue for us? Like oftentimes they say, hey, I need an updated bank statement. We go, hmm, could there be anything in that bank statement that could be a problem? So our job is seeing around corners, making sure you don't have problems. We are never going to allow you to release that loan contingency if there's an issue with the loan or if there's a potential deal breaker in there. At that point in time, we'll get on the phone with your realtor, we'll get on the phone with the listing agent and say, hey, here's where we're at with the loan, we're good with all of this, 
borrower is getting me X item, as soon as X item is signed off, we're absolutely cool releasing the, the loan contingency. And with that, agents are our understanding. Jeb said this a million times on here. I can deal with communication. You can't just go silent and not perform according to the terms of the contract. That's pretty darn rare. Most of our loans, we've done all the legwork up front. I have two borrowers right now that were just finishing their pre-approval, very well qualified borrowers, but with little curveballs, little quirks in their file. And we are putting those together and sending them to underwriting now before they even write offers so that we know we're not pushing that out. So hopefully the lender that you're working with has that ability to kind of look and see around corners, takes that philosophy of let's get this cleared as early in the process as possible, if not even before writing offers, because of all of these things, it's probably the most important. It doesn't involve the seller. It doesn't involve your realtors. It just comes down to, do you qualify? You know, home inspection, something can come up, but you can negotiate that. An appraisal, something can come up, you can negotiate that. There's not a lot of negotiation in terms of the loan. It is what it is. So we need to front load that and move it as early in the process as possible. Yeah, and then the next couple of steps can kind of interchangeable depending on where you're located, how your lender operates. Uh, but, you know, usually what happens is, you know, your closing disclosure is going to go out from your lender. And, and Josh, you can talk about that in a little bit more detail, how soon that goes out, when can that go out. But then you're really, then you're signing loan docs, right? And, and, and the process of signing loan docs, Josh, I kind of want to elaborate on that a little bit because people often think that, hey, I signed the initial loan application. I, I'm good to go. I, I've signed everything I need to sign. And the reality is, no, you got to sign the actual loan documents in front of a notary. Um, sometimes it's at a closing office. Sometimes it's at your house. Uh, but but that's really the, the next step in the process, Josh. So let's talk about what a closing disclosure is. When does that go out? And how does that, how does that get us to the next step of actually getting loan docs? So 15 years ago, there was no such thing as a loan estimate or a closing disclosure. You would get what was called a good faith estimate. And oh, by I good faith, they, they, they meant it was just good faith. You were <laughs> trusting that the person that you were talking to knew what they were talking about and was honestly giving you an estimate of all the things you're going to have to pay at closing. Well, post 2008 meltdown, the government came in and said, this is not working. People are not being told what they need to know. And they're getting shocks, not surprises. They're getting shocks when they go to sign their loan documents. So now we have a system where you get a loan estimate up front. The loan estimate has, is the part of the documentation. It's the most important part of those disclosures that I have to get out to you, that any lender has to get out to you within three days of receiving your contract. With that, the loan estimate tells you this is what you're likely to pay. And all of the things on there have various tolerances. Some of them have zero tolerance. They cannot change from the loan estimate to the closing at all. Some of them can change up to 10%. And those are generally things that you can shop for. If you don't have any control over it, we have to disclose it correctly up front. And there's no deviating from and that. And what are some change. examples of that, Josh? Um, something, any first party charges, points uh, that we're going to charge uh, is, is the big one. So in box A on your loan estimate, those are all things that are paid to the lender. So if the lender says, hey, there's no processing fee, so there's nothing for a processing fee in the loan estimate, then the closing disclosure goes out and says $800 for a processing fee. Nope, cannot happen. You didn't disclose it up front. So box A is going to tell you all your first party stuff. And that's the one that nothing can ever change in without a valid change of circumstance. Yeah, well, what does that mean? What's a valid change of circumstance? Transaction doesn't close on time. Rates have gone up. We need to get a rate extension. That um, it's not the lender's fault that it didn't close on time. If it's the lender's fault, it technically should not change. But assuming new construction and it wasn't done on time, we had to get an extension for 15 days. That would fall under box A. Um, some of the things like, like escrow and title, it depends on how they are disclosed. Um, recording fees have to be disclosed correctly because you do not get to shop for those. But escrow and title, if you have the ability to shop for them and how they go out in the disclosures, those are the things that can change a maximum of 10%. So they can't vary a ton. You can't be shocked at closing. So that closing disclosure, now we know more about the transaction. Maybe you guys renegotiated appraisal came in and you negotiated the price $10,000 lower or we negotiated a $5,000 seller credit. The closing disclosure is going to show all of those items on there. And you have to have that to review at least three days prior to signing your loan documents. Now, Jeb, you asked about timing of it. For us, as soon as we have a loan approval, 
an appraisal, and for the most part, your homeowner's insurance, because that's another cost in there that we need uh, third-party validation on. Once we have those three items, we're going to send that closing disclosure out so that we're not tight here at the end waiting and saying, oh, cool, loan docs are out, but you can't sign for three days because the closing disclosure just went out. So when you get your loan documents, an important distinction here, Jeb, that I always like to tell people, the loan documents are truly where the rubber hits the road. You signing your initial disclosures is saying, yes, that's what I want. That's the loan I'm applying for. And I am agreeing to that rate, those fees. But you are not signing up to take on that loan. People always ask me, when can I back out? When can I change a lender? Am I saying I am borrowing $482,000 when I sign my disclosures? No. You are doing that when you sign your loan documents. In the loan documents, it's much like your initial set of disclosures. It is a huge pack of paperwork, 90% of which is uh, irrelevant boilerplate that is in there for the purposes of the lender because they got sued somewhere along the line. So they clarified something or it's a government mandated disclosure that they have to make to you. So what we like to do before you go in to sign your loan documents, we send out your estimated closing statement from escrow. So escrow has got those docs. They're gathering all the third party charges. So above and beyond the CD, it's even more accurate. So it's going to show you what you're expected to bring in in terms of cash to close. We're going to pull out your first payment letter that goes in the loan documents. And it's going to say principal and interest is this, taxes is this, insurance is this. They're impounded. They're not impounded. There's mortgage insurance. And then we're going to pull out the note. The note is going to say you owe $482,000, it's 5.75% interest, and it's a 30-year loan. So those are the really the most important things. If you and I review those, if your lender and you review those before the notary comes out to sign your loan documents, before you go to title to sit at the closing table with everyone and sign your loan documents, that's the important stuff. The other... 100 pages in that documentation is there for the benefit of other people to make sure they don't get sued. But you know, with the review of those documents, what your payment is, what you're borrowing, what your interest rate is, and how much money you're going to bring into closing and that that matches your original loan estimate. And, and Josh, you said something important there. And that's the, you know, the the fact that you're going to get, um, you know, how much money you need to bring into escrow to close. Uh, so you're going to get your final um, closing statement, if you will, not the final, but an estimated, if you will, showing the, the amount of funds you need to bring in based off, you know, the escrow deposit that you originally put in, um, you know, if, with your, your closing costs and, and your total down payment. So if you put a 3% escrow deposit down to start, but you're buying, uh, you know, the house and you put 20% down to buy that house, then you need to bring in the remaining 17%, right? Plus any additional closing costs down there in order to finalize this loan. And your loan can't record, it can't fund until those funds are at title um, at the escrow company. And that's something you're going to do after your loan docs uh, are signed. So typically speaking, you know, you're at the closing office, you know, the, the notary there, whoever's in front of you, the title officer is going to provide you with that estimate. And you're going to take that estimate to the bank the next day. Um, and you're going to wire that money, uh, or get a cashier's check for that amount. Now, Josh, we mentioned earlier in the episode, if you're wiring that money, it's really, really, really important on, on the final wire of, of these funds to verify the, escrow that's company. the big wire. That's the big wire. And They've had the process to see the email exchanges going back and forth. They know what's going on. This is when, you know, if 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 the wire fraud is going to take place, it's typically going to take place on the backside. The initial deposit is at, I would say, less of a risk, it's still a risk, less of a risk than the final deposit. So you're wiring a lot of money here at the end of the transaction. Just make the additional call to the escrow company, to the co title company. Verify the wiring instructions, verify the information you received just to make sure it's accurate before sending that wire. That wire goes there. And then that, that's essentially going to take, you know, some days your loan might fund the same day, depending on what state you're in. Um, it might fund the next day. It might fund two days later, depending on the, the actual process there. You have a closing date, which your lender's trying to meet. Some days you might sign your loan docs a week in advance, depending on how fast your lender was able to get you there. So there might be a delay in the time that you've signed to your closing date, just based on, on how quickly that process went, or in some cases, maybe how slow that process went. Maybe you're signing them at the last minute, but you're typically trying to close on that last day. And in some states, uh, like here in California, depending on the county that you're in, you might record the same day that, that uh, the loan funds. 
in other counties here in California, it records the following day, at which point that's when you get the keys to the property. Now, one, one step I kind of missed here in the sense is that you're going to do a final walkthrough on that property, right? Oftentimes, not all the time, more often than not, you're going to do a final walkthrough. Now that final walkthrough can happen before you sign loan docs or after you sign loan, doc, loan docs, just depending on where you are in the process, how much time you have. And that's really just a re-verification of the property, right? When you walk through the property initially, you saw it with furniture in it. You saw it with all the belongings of, of the, the previous owner. And more often than not, your final walkthrough is coming at a time when the seller's property has been removed. It's already been packed up. You're able to see the property vacant. Uh, maybe there were repairs negotiated as part of your repair request and they've completed those repairs and you're walking through the property to make sure those repairs were actually completed properly. Um, you know, in, in a, a work like manner, you know, by a professional or what have you, whatever, you know, you're trying to reconfirm it's typically done during that, that final walkthrough. Now, I, I, sometimes there's tenants staying in a property, a seller's renting back for 30 days. There were no repairs, uh, you know, renegotiated. So sometimes there's not a final walkthrough of a property, but more often than not, the buyer wants to walk through and just make sure that the property's in the same condition. Now, what happens if the property's not in the same condition? There's a new hole in the wall or the repairs weren't completed. Well, then you don't have to close on that property. It's it's up to your agent, it's up to you and 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 the other parties to renegotiate to get those things finalized prior to closing on that property because once the property closes, it you know, it records or what have you, it's much harder to get those items completed. Now, fortunately and unfortunately, I've been in the case where, you know, I've closed on properties and we've had to do things after the fact and they've they've worked out. Um, but it's some in some instances it comes with, you know, having to push people and make things and 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 threaten uh the other side to make sure these things are 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 completed. So it's it's better to make sure it's done prior to closing. Um uh, but you know we, we've talked about the idea of signing loan docs. We've talked about the idea of wiring those funds and it's really closing Josh. So, so what happens um, at closing is, is that when you get to party? Is that when you get the keys? No. So, so think about that. It's again, that timeline is a big question for everyone. And this varies around the country. You may be listening outside of California. You may be at a state where they have uh, a funding or a closing where you, the seller, the attorney, everyone sits around a table and the funds went with a check to the title company and you sign your loan documents and it all happens right there. For us in California and for many other escrow states, it goes like this. You sign your loan documents. You and I went through and say, okay, you need to send $73,000.98 over to escrow. You wire that over. So a lot of times I'll get that question, okay, I signed docs and I wired my money. Is the house mine? No, because your money went to escrow. The funding is actually when the lender's money goes over to escrow. So with that, we talked about conditions and conditional loan approval. At that point, there's generally not conditions from you, but escrow and title and the lender can be working on just connecting the last few dots. Usually it's a formality, three to five little items. They go back and forth on the day of the funding and now that wire goes over. So in this case, now your funds are at escrow, the lender's funds are at escrow, everything is funded. The house is not yours until it's released for recording and the county recorder records that deed that says John and Jane Doe are no longer the owners. Um, Martine Rivera is now the new owner. And at that point, you can reach out to your realtor and per the terms of your contract, you will get keys and possession of the property. Yeah, oftentimes us as real estate agents, mortgage professionals, we know about the closing prior to you with the with the county recorder because the title office is calling us, the lender's calling us, whatever, and letting us know, hey, it's funded, it's recorded, it's a done deal, congratulations, we appreciate the hard work, all of that. And then it gives us the joy um, in, in, in being able to call the buyers and say, congratulations, the home is yours. And we set up a time to, to pass over those keys. But you know, Josh said something important there. It doesn't happen until it actually records. I've been involved in transactions where the transactions were you know, funded and it didn't record. It, the wire was called back for whatever reason. So just to understand in this process, nothing is done until it's done, until you have those keys in your hand. And that's not to scare you. It's just to 
you know, provide some some transparency, if you will, um, that things can happen in the process. And you just want to make sure that you're you're following through, not doing anything crazy on your end to jeopardize it, uh, making sure you have your job, not you know, quitting your job before your loan closes. We have stories of all of that too that we could talk about in another episode. Um, but that really gets you to the finalize, uh, the, the, the final stage of the process of closing on that home. So at this point, you're a homeowner, you, you own a home, we've, we've walked you through that journey. So congratulations on, on getting there. Josh, what's next? What's next is the quiet enjoyment of your home. Actually, you know, for most people, you, you want to start your project. You want to figure out where your big screen's going to go, who's coming over for the barbecue. So Jeb and I, for the most part, just want to know when the housewarming party We're is. We're available. What we, can, what we can bring. We're available. No. So with that said, guys, hopefully that provides um, some clarity in that process. We appreciate you, you know, joining us along this journey of, of, of walking through that process um, and, and helping you become the educated home buyer. Until then. See you soon.